Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we travel across the country to meet our community's solution seekers. We go inside a California museum housing comedy legend Cheech Marin's impressive collection of Chicano art. And in Philadelphia, we catch up with the creator of the Steadicam, who's hoping to give mobility to those in need with his latest invention. But first, we take a look at the national shortage of EMT workers. Carter Evans reports on the possible life and death consequences. Are you still six out of 10 pain? Denise Farnsworth loves her job as an EMT. It's what I live to do. But after seven years on the job, she can no longer afford to keep doing it. What is your base hourly rate? 18. $18 an hour? Yes. To pay the bills, we have to work as much as we can. Farnsworth actually makes slightly more than the national median wage for EMTs. The Bureau of Labor Statistics lists it as one of the lowest paying jobs in health care. That's the primary reason roughly a third of all EMTs quit in 2021. And the industry is having a hard time replacing them. A 2022 study found that 39% of part-time EMT and 55% of part-time paramedic positions went unfilled because of a lack of qualified candidates. It's an absolute crisis. We have continual paramedics hitting the exit doors and leaving the field. American and Ambulance Association President Sean Bayard decides. says Medicaid's reimbursement for non-emergency transports, like moving a patient between hospitals or taking someone to dialysis, keeps wages low. It can mean the difference of having an ambulance or not having an ambulance. AMR, the nation's largest private ambulance provider, is ending non-emergency transport in Los Angeles County. They cite low Medicaid reimbursement as a major reason for a three and a half million dollar budget deficit in that market alone. It's unsustainable. To keep from losing employees like Denise, their manager Brian Napoli says a raise is in the works, but the company can't afford it long term. And if Medicaid reimbursements don't increase, they may also have to stop non-emergency response. How much does it cost you to make a run on average? Over $250. And how much do you get back? $107 in the base rate. A losing proposition. The California law goes into effect that can require a $22 an hour minimum wage for fast food workers. There is no mandated pay for EMTs. Why is it that we can't get movement for the people that are serving our communities at their most vulnerable moments? Leaving to East Farnsworth at a crossroads. I don't want to leave. I don't know what else I would want to do. We stay in California for our next story. Comedian Cheech Marin opened a museum known as The Cheech, housing America's largest collection of Mexican-American art. Our Anthony Mason got a personal tour from the actor himself. This is kind of the centerpiece? Yeah, this was commissioned for the museum by the De La Torre brothers. In the lobby, you're greeted by a 26-foot-tall lenticular installation of an Aztec earth goddess. It almost feels alive. It is alive. You can see something new every time you look at it, yeah. This is the new Cheech Marin Center for Chicano Art and Culture in Riverside, California. Your name's over the door. Yeah. <laughs> is that cool? I got that in as soon as I possibly could. You know, <laughs> what should we call this? I the Cheech would be a good name. It's a great name. I think so, too. It's so gratifying that I don't really dwell on that so much. I just watch the people come in and watch them enjoy it. All right, but thanks for all you do, bro. We, all right, we're so proud of this. Thank you. Thank you for coming this down. This is amazing. How does that feel? It's beyond a dream. You know, I never dreamed this dream. It's too big a dream. Oh, my God. Look at that. Look at that. Cheech donated more than 500 paintings, drawings, and sculptures to the new museum that bears his name. Chicano art, he says, isn't a style of painting. It's more a flavor of the Mexican-American community. Carlos Alamaraz, I, I always call the John Coltrane of, of Chicano painters because he puts the paint on with such spontaneity. Works by dozens of artists, like Wayne Alaniz Healy. I describe it as Norman Rockwell meets Jackson Pollock. It's a drip painting, but, exactly. it's, but it's figurative. And this one jumped off the wall at me. I go, whoa. What? 
This one here it was a painting by Margaret Garcia. Who called the Chicano Gauguin. The Chicano Gauguin, you know. This is by uh, Frank Romero, uh -huh. the arrest of the paleteros. The oh, paleteros are ice cream men. So this is MacArthur Park. And, and they were going to try to clean up MacArthur Park because there was gangs and there was trouble. So what they did is they sent them the SWAT team to arrest the ice cream men. And you can see it. I mean, this is like the little kids with the popsicles over their head. Who's that guy? Oh, that's the uh, Chicano Mona Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> King of Chicano art. <laughs> That's really great. This is by Eloy Torres. All the painters at some point, they go, if I paint a picture of Cheech, he'll probably buy it. Hmm. <laughs> I was born in East LA. Born in East LA, Cheech started collecting Chicano art about 1985. It's an addiction. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Cheech and I'm an art addict. What do you think that addiction is all about? I think it's about love of the subject. I've been a collector of anything since I was a little kid. Marbles, baseball cards, stamps, anything. What's your name? Isn't it on there on the license, man? Yeah, that's it, Pedro de Pacas, man, that's my name. <laughs> Richard Cheech Marin made his name, of course, as part of the cannabis-infused comedy team, Cheech and Chong. Mexican Americans don't like to get up early in the morning, but they have to, so they do it real slow. Their success and other acting roles allowed Cheech to invest in his passion. I was the perfect storm. I, I knew what the art was, I had money to collect it, and I had a, a celebrity in order to proselytize for it. It's one of the most wonderful Chicano expressions of spiritual awakening that I've ever seen. Cheech was determined to tour his collection, taking it to some 50 museums around the country in 2002 to the Smithsonian. And what we were saying with this exhibit is Chicano is American because you cannot say American without including that part of, of the Latino pie. Then in 2017, the city of Riverside, with a population more than 50% Latino, wanted to find a new mission for its old library. Riverside came to you. Yes, that is the part that I never expected. I didn't understand what they were saying at first. You want me to buy a museum? I'm doing pretty good, but I don't know if I'm museum rich. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we want to give you the museum. You give us the collection, we'll, and we'll take care of it. We'll be Okay, you know, let's go and <laughs> jump off the cliff, you know, and then away we went. After a nearly $13 million renovation, the Cheech was born. And then this goes around and it's been dipped in blood, all these hearts. Oh, wow. How does this rank with your movies? Oh. Your comedy? You know, I'm, I'm equally proud of both, but the pride that, that emanates from this one is, is beyond anything. I hear it, I hear it again. Cheech is still making movies, three in the last year alone, including the romantic comedy Shotgun Wedding. Are you still collecting? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even try not to. You know? I, mean, I don't fake it anymore because I, I, I'm not a zillionaire and say, hey, send over two tons of that art. You know? And that's why I work all the time. I'm working, oh, I can get that painting because there's still masterpieces of Chicano art being made by the best artists right now. Yeah. But there's no greater joy than standing in front of a new painting like, wow, is that cool? You know, that's the best part of it. Still ahead, ping pong therapy for mind and body. This is I in America. Welcome back. Ping pong may just seem like some old fashioned fun, but it turns out table tennis can also be therapy for those with Parkinson's disease. Nearly 90,000 people in the U.S. are diagnosed each year. Meg Oliver shows us how the game is serving up a boost for the mind and body. Three years ago, Robin Seltzer was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. The once athletic 67-year-old symptoms were so bad he could barely get out of bed. I kind of was in the middle of COVID. I couldn't get access to a doctor. So how I, bad did it get? I lost 70 pounds. Uh, it, I, I was <laughs> flapping. All right. 
Along with physical therapy and medication to manage symptoms like tremors, stiffness, and slowness, Dr. Alana Klar at Hackensack University Medical Center offered a surprising option. When your doctor first said you should do ping pong, what was your reaction? My reaction was, how could that help anybody? Ping pong has clearly been shown to have a positive impact on their progression of the disease and in a way that the medication alone is not doing. Dr. Clark and neuropsychologist Elizabeth Kara co-founded the New Jersey chapter of Ping Pong Parkinson, a nonprofit with more than 200 chapters in 26 countries, including an international competition. How does ping pong help? A Parkinson's patient. Areas involved in motor planning also have ties to other areas of the brain that impact those cognitive skills that we see impacted in Parkinson's disease, things like the planning, the problem solving. And so when we're playing ping pong, we know that those areas of the brain end up being activated. While all forms of exercise are beneficial, the thing that makes ping pong unique is that it incorporates a focus on balance, hand-eye coordination, and the rhythm or pace of reciprocal play. So it really hits the trifecta of physical, cognitive, and social activities. Every Tuesday night in River Edge, New Jersey, Parkinson's patients, or pongers as they're called, play with volunteers of all ages called hitters. There's a tendency if you're Parkinsonian to stand like this. Right. And this forces you... To move. To move. Right? Yeah. You're yeah. forcing me to move. Oh! She's a ringer. <laughs> <laughs> when I start up, I'm a little stiff. My shots are a little bit off. My timing's a little bit off. And I'm a little bit frustrated. Uh -huh. And then after about 15 or 20 minutes, suddenly things kick in. How long does that last in terms of feeling a little bit looser and more relaxed? I'd say it lasts at least a couple of days. The goal is to improve attention, movement, mood, and social connection among people striving to outpace a progressive disease. How has it changed your outlook on the future? It's kind of opened me up to new experiences. Like I've thought over the last few weeks, maybe I could get back on skis. You know, Even if it's just going down the bunny slope, I really miss that. This is opening doors. It is, yes it is. It's opening doors and it, it provides a certain amount of imagination. We now turn to a growing number of women who are purchasing firearms. Mark Strassman visits the range to talk with some women about why they're buying guns. Okay. Got a good stance? In the heart of Alabama, gun country, Gracie Barhill squeezed off round after round, warming to her month-old Smith & Wesson 9mm. There are things that you don't account for when you see it in John Wick movies. I'm young, I'm a girl, um, I never know when a threat's gonna come. I mean, that's probably my favorite one. Well, of course. <laughs> this 19-year-old's here for girls, guns, and gear. On Scott Recchio's gun range, it's a self-defense firearms course, targeting women wary of threats. It's absolutely undeniable. The world is changing, and they want to be ahead of it. Forget gun shy. Nationally, one in three first-time gun buyers was a woman. All right, go ahead. Like Emma Boutwell. I was definitely very nervous whenever I first shot. I need to know how to defend myself. <laughs> Let's do two rounds this time. Gun instructor Beverly Allridge teaches these women marksmanship, gun safety, situational awareness. It's one more tool in a toolbox. How is instructing women different than instructing men? Women listen better than men do. <laughs> women are just quicker just to hear and take in what they're being told and applying that. Nikita Gordon comes armed with another trend. Among black women, the firearm homicide rate has more than tripled since 2010. Today, nearly 30% of new women gun owners are black. Because there's so many random attacks on women, I have more confident now that I'm carrying and now I don't have to second guess what am I gonna do. So this oh. is actually the holster system. She showed us cute and cocky. Her line of women's clothes and holsters designed to hide a gun fashionably and show self-confidence, the bullseye of most women gun owners. To not only feel safer, but to empower ourselves, to be able to move freely in the world without immediate threats. Many will never leave home without it. Alabama has America's highest rate of concealed weapons. 
Coming up, we'll introduce you to the inventor of the Steadicam, who helped develop a device that may smooth out mobility for millions. That story is next. Those silky smooth shots you've seen in movies and sports are thanks to a man named Garrett Brown, inventor of the Steadicam. It turns out that some of the same concepts of the camera can be applied to all kinds of moving objects. I got the chance to see firsthand how his newest invention is helping people with disabilities. Does this ever get old? No, it's, it's fantastic. I love it up here. When we caught up with Garrett Brown five years ago. Let's go. Are you Come doing on. it? You're really doing it? We literally had to catch our breath. Racing the same steps made famous in the Oscar winning film, Rocky. We just added it up. That was the fourth time I've run up the stairs in, in earnest. The Rocky, Rocky II, Rocky V, and with you. Michelle Miller <laughs> for CBS. A contender. What made Brown a contender back in 1974 was what he gave cinematographers a lightweight handheld stabilizer that allowed them to move with the action seamlessly. Before, cameras used dollies on rails to shoot movement. After, his creation revolutionized Hollywood movie making. Who could forget this scene from The Shining? Or this chase in The Return of the Jedi? Now standard issue. The Steadicam has evolved beyond film. There's the Sky Cam, the Fly Cam, the Dive Cam. It's a human machine interface, which is something that is enduringly interesting to me. And as a matter of fact, this present item is a human machine interface. And the Philadelphia native is at it again. This time to help people with disabilities move in real time. May I? Yes. This is seated. And this is standing. And it made the move for me, you know? He calls his latest invention the zine. What is it that we need? We need a comfortable chair. We need to not have to ditch that chair to get moving. But hey, let's get to your feet without the whine of motors and slow, you know, let's get to your feet like a kid. Named after the inventor of the pedalist bicycle, Baron Von Drees, users maneuver it in much the same way riders did back then. The 80-year-old came up with the idea a decade ago while visiting his then 97-year-old dad in care facilities. I was watching his pals, and something big seemed to me missing between walkers and wheelchairs. Once you consign yourself to a wheelchair, your feet are not on the ground particularly. You're not upright. Being upright is great for your cardiac, your bone density, your, your limbic system, your digestive system, and it's particularly valuable for your uh, psychological well-being. To be up among your fellow humans is one of the things we hear most often that they love about this machine. That's when the former folk singer and voiceover actor got to work. These are your handlebars. Okay. Just push them forward. Oh, you just push it. Oh, OK. Now, you've got seat belts on either side. Squeeze these and drop all the way down to a seated position okay. and let go. Boom. Now, it took walk. about a decade of inventing and tinkering. Make the rear spin around you. Oh, okay. ah, yeah. There That's we it. go. For Brown and a small team of engineers to get the machine just right. Come on. I'm coming. Come on. I'm coming. <laughs> this is really agile. It is. It maneuvers well. It is. You can move, you know, in any direction. You had a lot of practice. Sideways. Well, yeah, of course. Starting with prototypes. This is our history of oh where my. this came from. Was this the first one? I took an old walker and had this saddle welded onto it just to see what's this feel like, you know? Wow. Some that look rather ridiculous to him now. You have to be willing to look fairly goofy and silly when you're testing prototypes for machines that work with humans. Good, keep going. I'm just gonna let you go past me. He began marketing them at healthcare conventions, AARP conferences, 
anywhere he could reach people with limited mobility. To date, he's produced about a hundred zines. We'll head inside. We'll get you all set up with your new zine. Awesome. Sound good? It's already attracting customers like Anami Fatal, who relied mostly on her powered wheelchair and rollator. With the rollator, there's absolutely no support. All of my energy when I use that requires me to focus on not falling, which is why I can't even use a rollator without assistance. Start bending your knees, sending your hips backwards, just sitting yourself down. Yep. There you go, all the that. way down. On the day of our visit, she tried out her new zine. Not being able to do a set to stand yourself like that, it gives you back something that you lost, that you miss every day. Yep, so there you go, it's following you around. The instant that we give you so this A, degree of freedom, and B, autonomy, and that's an important word with this, when you're in it and you're safe, you're on your own. It's become almost a higher calling, made even more evident when Brown traveled to Rome to make a special delivery. How did that happen? I was looking at a video report of Pope Francis struggling with mobility. I thought he could use one of these things. The letter he wrote must have been convincing. Because it went around the Vatican and we were vetted. And didn't we get back a wonderful letter saying, yes, we accept, thank you very much. And we heard later it's in his apartment. So. The story is unfolding. No official sighting. No yet. official sighting. But, you know, if, if it's useful to Pope Francis, that would be really, really satisfying. Now drop yourself down okay. to any height you care to. Brown is hoping to get word out to anyone who can benefit from the zine that, like his most famous invention, this new one is here to help. Inventing is what we do for a good life. I mean, in inventing a life is imagining what you want, that is to say, what's missing, and what do you have to do to get there. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America. Sponsored by United Healthcare Medicare Plants. Get Medicare with more.